I will throw anything that you choose over this building. If oh. I do it, we win the quiz. This video is about this guy, Ralph Einson. Okay, technically it's about a character he voices. This guy, Sadolphus Telemann, aka Sid. That's a name that Final Fantasy fans know quite well, because he's far from the first Sid in the series. But after nearly 40 years of Final Fantasy history, I fully believe that Final Fantasy XVI Sid is the best one. Here's why. Final Fantasy has one of the richest histories of any video game series ever. Since 1987, when the original game graced the NES, we've seen recurring features like spellcasting, classes, and even specific creatures and characters. Sid himself debuted in Final Fantasy II, so this one from FF16 is the latest in a long line of gentlemen with the same name. He's not even the first one to have the full name Sidolphus but he still stands tall as my favorite of the bunch. And there's a lot of competition there. I mean, we've even seen Moogle and robot versions of Sid. He's appeared in every mainline game since too, plus lots of spin-offs, and nearly every time he plays a similar role. Whether he's an active member of the party or not, he is almost always involved with an airship. Now there are some exceptions to this, and Final Fantasy 16 is one of the biggest, this Sid isn't a mechanical engineer, though I suppose you could say he engineers people as the leader of a resistance group. Plus, in the world of Valisthea, airships are derelict things of the past. The Fallen Ruin. I've heard some call it an airship. Much like Valisthea itself, Final Fantasy as a series is chock full of history, and no single character has had as much of a part of that history as Sid. No human has ever played him quite like Ralph Einstein either. If you don't recognize his name or face, that's fine. But you'll never forget his incredible voice. Well, I had this glass-walled office, which was bigger than my house. It was an enormous thing. It was very cool. Einstein has been in critically acclaimed series like Game of Thrones and Chernobyl, as well as incredible films like The Witch and The Green Knight. We're not going to spoil any of those movies here, but we will be talking about Final Fantasy XVI up through the first mission of Act II. So here's your second spoiler warning. And okay, that should be a long enough pause. Well, come on then. What you're seeing right now is Sid's first appearance in Final Fantasy XVI. Let me set the scene. Our protagonist Clive has been sent to kill the Dominant of Shiva. And in case you need a refresher, dominants are the humans who can transform into massive beasts known as icons. Summons aren't new to the series. In fact, the almighty dragon Bahamut has literally been around since the first game, but thematically they play a different role here. For the most part, they're pawns of war, bringing a magical strength to the battlefield on behalf of the country that more or less controls them. When Clive realizes that the dominant of Shiva is his childhood friend Jill, he turns his blade against his own squad, refusing to take the life of someone he once cared about. This will be relevant again in a little bit. Attacking his own men means that Clive is now left alone against the army of the Dalmechian Republic. Just as it looks like this could be the end for our hero, powerful lightning strikes rain down on the battlefield. And when the dust settles, out walks Sid. This rescue immediately makes us indebted to him. Were it not for his electric rescue, Final Fantasy XVI would have been over before it even started. In screenwriting, we call this the save the cat moment. It's when a character does something kind or noble, signaling to us that they are indeed the good guy. Clive has his own version of this during the flashback, as he treats a bearer with kindness. That's also relevant to this entire video. The bearers, those who are born with the ability to cast magic, are at the bottom of Valisthea's caste system. Their plight is central to the overall plot. And if a dramatic rescue wasn't enough to make you like Sid from the get-go, he also reunites us with our childhood pet, a very good boy named Torgal. You two acquainted? Well then, you won't mind taking him off my hands. Okay, back to the bearers. Once Sid heroically saves us from being surrounded by soldiers, we're taken to his hideaway. This is where we learn why he rescued us in the first place. 
We already know that Sid is a magic user himself, but it turns out he's the dominant of the lightning icon Ramu. Seeing his people, the bearers, treated so poorly radicalized him. He has a decorated past as the former Lord Commander of Walud, but he left that life behind to make a safe haven for bearers. His group, known as the Cursebreakers, fights for the less fortunate across Falisthea, and they've garnered quite a reputation. Sid's name is passed around with fear, reverence, hope, or disgust, depending on who you're talking to. And when Sid talks to Clive back at the hideaway, he invites him to become a part of this noble operation. Often in the Final Fantasy series, new party members join because they believe in the cause you're already fighting for. That's the main thrust of Final Fantasy VI, for example. In the case of XVI, Clive is being brought into a rebel group that's already established. What say you, Clive? Will you join us? I like that slight twist here. And to twist things a little further from the norm, Sid isn't your typical rebel leader. He isn't trying to start or even win a war. This isn't about making a castle crumble. It's about giving the outcasts a place to live outside of those castle walls, where they can live out the rest of their lives the way they see fit. I only wish to offer our kind of choice, a place where we can die on our own terms. So not only is Sid fighting for what is right, but he's doing so with a level head. That's even more respectable. Seeing that Clive was willing to go against orders to do what was right, his invitation to the Curse Breakers is a no-brainer. I mean, that's why Sid created the group in the first place. While a lot of his past is left vague in Final Fantasy XVI, we know that he betrayed the King of Walud at some point, which led him to becoming this freedom fighter. We've firmly established that he's a stand-up guy by this point, but not everyone is happy with the path he took to get there. Is this how you recruit all of your charges? Don't recall you complaining, Benedicta. This is Benedicta, one of the key villains in the game's first act. Sid's relationships with other characters are another reason why I like him so much, but his dynamic with Benedicta, the dominant of Garuda, is especially interesting. Benedicta is head of the Intelligencers, another elite force from Walud. This kept her in close proximity with Sid, and there's a very emotional history there. Yes, there seems to have been romance at some point, but as we learn in a flashback, Benedicta also owes her leadership position to Sid. They met when he saved her from a very dark place. It's clear that Sid is on the right side of history in the present day too, but given that it took him away from Benedicta, she harbors a whole lot of resentment. In fact, she feels outright betrayed. While she's certainly called upon Garuda before, her emotions about Sid, their opposed positions, and her place in this whole wretched world is what leads her to summon Garuda during the events of the game. But let's talk about the normies for a sec. How Sid acts toward fellow magic users or old flames is one thing, but his treatment of common folk is just as important. While the man has a global reputation thanks to the exploits of the Curse Breakers, he also has a personal reputation amongst his crew. Just walking around the hideaway, you'll hear refugees talking about how much they appreciate him. One of my favorite examples is Gav, a Curse Breaker who doesn't always get the most exciting job during missions. During the raid on Kaer Norvent, Sid assigns him the duty of watching the gate, rather than being an active part of the raid. He does this with some sweet talk and a knowing wink toward Clive. Well, when you put it that way. But he's not just brown nosing here. After the mission succeeds, Sid thanks Gav for dutifully fulfilling his assignment. That's just being a good boss right there. But what matters is they're safe. Something they wouldn't be had it not been for you, Gav. I briefly mentioned this at the beginning, but Final Fantasy has always had classes. Final Fantasy XVI's party members aren't explicitly assigned to any, but in my mind, this sort of smooth talking really puts Sid in the category of rogue. It makes for a nice contrast to Clive's textbook Paladin. We've seen how Sid gets along with others, so let's take a look at his dynamic with Clive. It's the most important one for our hero's development. Sid sees a fire in Clive, and I'm not talking about the flames of the phoenix or the smoldering embers of Ifrit. Sid sees the desire for revenge burning behind Clive's eyes, and he wants to temper it. He saw Clive turn his blade to save his friend Jill, so he already knows that Clive is capable of moving against fate. 
That's Sid's whole deal. I knew a girl back in the day. She was a slave to her fate, just like you. Clive wants to find the man who killed his brother Joshua. And, well, I did say spoiler alert, but you should already know if you're watching this video that Clive himself is the one who did it. He summoned Ifrit, but couldn't control him. Sid witnesses another transformation into Ifrit, when Clive chases after Benedicta in her Garuda form. Upon seeing this, Sid again calls out to Clive to control his burning rage. The entire first act is centered around this, around Sid teaching Clive how to move on from what happened to Joshua and not be a slave to revenge. Just as Sid seeks to change the fate of bearers, he wants Clive to acknowledge that his destructive path isn't the only way forward. He's not above using a bit of dark humor to drive that point home either. Find out if this man's responsible and kill yourself if he's not. Once Clive can accept this, he is all in on the Curse Breaker's cause. And let me tell you, Final Fantasy XVI conveys this with some of the best Ludo narrative I have ever seen. The term Ludo narrative refers to how the story and gameplay intersect, and a lot of the times it doesn't quite match up. But when Clive returns to the ruins of Phoenix Gate, his fights against the Infernal Icon and Infernal Shadow play out perfectly. The Infernal Icon represents Clive's rage, and only by facing this representation of Afrit, the very thing that killed Joshua, can he finally accept what happened. After that comes a fight against the Infernal Shadow, which is of course a reflection of Clive himself. But this fight isn't about defeating part of his psyche. This shadow is here to teach him something. The result of this battle is Clive being able to actively harness the power of Afrit and even activate his limit break. This breakthrough is owed, in large part, to Sid's guidance. Limit breaks obviously make a big difference in combat, and while cutscene conversations between Clive and Sid are important, they'll spend even more time actively fighting side by side. This is where we see another awesome aspect of Sid, his sacrifice. What do I mean by that? Well, there are two ways to look at it. The first is simply how he handles himself in a fight. At the end of the story mission, The Hunter and the Hunted, you have to face a dangerous duo, Dragon Avis and the Knight of the Dying Sun. Sid immediately rushes the dragon, leaving you to fight the Dragoon. He's not just smart and strategic, he's taking on the potentially tougher enemy so that you can focus on the other. Now let's examine what Sid is really doing during combat. Yes, he's swinging a sword and providing moral support, but he's a dominant like Clive. As such, his signature move is unleashing powerful bolts of magical lightning by channeling Ramu. That sounds pretty par for the course, but here's the thing. Sid is different from other dominants. It's revealed after the Fafnir fight that using Ramu's power actually hurts Sid. Coughing up blood is shorthand for, hey, this person is in pain every time they do this. The game draws attention to it in this cutscene, but this revelation implies so much more. When Sid saved Clive and Jill from the soldiers at the start of the game, when he blew open the locked door holding the captives in Lost Wing, when he cast lightning spells in the middle of combat, every single one of these actions hurt him. And it's easy to forget that. There is a physical toll on his body every time he uses Ramu's power, and yet he continues to do so for the greater good. Couple that with the mental stress of leading a group like the Curse Breakers, and it's a wonder he's able to keep going at all. Sid, are you alright? Do I look alright? Of course, there is a limit to how much one man can take, and Sid reaches it at the end of Act 1. Yes, Sidolphus Telamon dies. Nothing good lasts forever, and the game foreshadows this as the moment draws closer. Coughing up blood was the first signal. Clive stealing Garuda's power from Benedicta was a hint that we might also siphon something from Sid, and his near fall into an aether mine on the way to the first Mother Crystal was a dead giveaway. No pun intended. <laughs> Destroying said crystal requires Sid to unleash a massive lightning bolt, and we already know what magic does to his body. It's the ultimate demonstration of Sid's dedication to his cause, and it's a textbook example of laying down one's life for the greater good. 
he's not the first Cid in the Final Fantasy series to die, but he is the only one to lead a resistance group, cultivate strong relationships with NPCs and party members, fight alongside you to the detriment of his own health, and roll all of that together in one final sacrifice. But he doesn't just instantly drop dead. After Clive's battle with Typhon, he snaps back into the real world to see his mentor lying there, drawing his final breath. Sid takes one last opportunity to defy fate, lashing out at the villainous Ultima, who appears behind Clive in the same moment. This defiant blow doesn't do much overall, but it signifies all that Sid stood for. He goes out swinging, fighting for the betterment of others. <laughs> This moment is also a passing of the torch. The Cursebreaker's leader is gone, and someone needs to keep things running. That someone is obviously going to be Clive, but it's not done in the way you might expect. Sidolphus Telamon dies, but Sid does not. When Act 2 begins, we see that Clive has taken on his name. It's good to see you, Sid. What have we learned? Things have changed since that fateful day at the Mother Crystal. Time has passed, armies have moved, and hey, we finally got that airship. Sort of. The Cursebreaker's new hideaway is inside the ruined chassis of one. But one thing has persisted. The legendary name of Sid. People still hear of his exploits, and they believe in the cause. That's because Clive kept the legend alive. That's what he wanted. What we want. And that's why I bear his name. In some ways, having a new Cid was inevitable. Side quests like Friend of the People or Welcoming Committee mean so much more in hindsight. Clive didn't know it, but he was slowly learning how to do Cid's job when he helped those bearers. And he's been on their side his whole life. Just like an employee climbing the ranks until they're appointed CEO, Clive was always training to take over. After all, even in the world of Final Fantasy XVI, Sid was more of a title than an individual. Time to earn that menacing title. Sid the Vicious, was it? You see, when I say Final Fantasy XVI has the best Sid, I'm not just talking about one man. To use a common phrase, Sid is the man, the myth, and the legend. That goes for this individual game, and for the Final Fantasy series at large. It's a meta thing. Sid has been a designation since Final Fantasy II. Passing the name down here is a representation of a trend that has gone on for decades. The Sid identity is more important than any one person, even Final Fantasy XVI's central protagonist. And that idea will continue. Final Fantasy XVII, XVIII, XIX, XX, and plenty of spin-offs in between will have their own Sids as well. But even as the lineage goes on, I will always look back fondly at Sidolphus Telamon from XVI. Freedom fighter, mentor, loyal companion, sacrificial leader, these aren't unique things at face value, but no other Cid can boast of the same collection of achievements. And there's certainly no other who passed the name down within a single story. So, here's to Cid. To Cid. Alright then, this is my impression of Ralph Einstein. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like what Framework is doing, definitely hit that subscribe button in the middle. It would help me out an awful lot if you do. And if you want to see what we've already cooked up, you can hit that link on the far left. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.